For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. All right, looks like we are live, guys. And I'm just going to do a quick audio check from the audience. Give me the A OK. If everything looks good, good to see a couple people here. Montaz, good to see you, brother. Him Snake sake i should say nightmare and him sake says love listening to sft in the wee hours while i work on my guitars <laughs> i know this is kind of a last minute late night stream uh you might have noticed i i scheduled uh, quite a few events in the next few days actually so at the top of my head tomorrow we've got um, at 3.30 EST, we've got Professor McQueen back with us to discuss more evidence on the flood, followed by Thursday. Thursday night is exciting. We've got Dr. Dino. Ken Hoven's going to be back with us at 8 EST, 7 Central. He's going to be debating Jordan from Reasons to Doubt Atheist podcast. They are going to be debating the age of the earth. So... Um, I'm really looking forward to that one. That's going to be a really good debate. They've actually debated in the past um, on the global flood. They've debated here on Standing for Truth. So this is kind of a rematch round two. So it's going to be a lot of fun. And on the Friday, we've got Otangelo and Philip Williams. They're going to be debating David Neff on whether or not Noah's Ark has been found. And then the Saturday, so we've got a packed week for you guys. Um, We've got Bill Morgan, who's going to be taking on uh, an atheist on the existence of God, if the evidence suggests a God. Next week, uh, I just confirmed today, I'm excited, Dr. Matt McLean will be here on probably the Thursday. We're just working out a time. Uh, he's a PhD paleontologist, so we are going to be discussing um, the mammal-like reptiles and uh, you know, the fossil record 
as well as barominology, and it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm really pumped for that too. So uh, a few other things in the works, but uh, until I confirm exact days and times, I'll kind of leave, uh, leave that for later. So uh, Nightmare, thank you so much for the super chat. I appreciate all the support, guys. You guys are the life and blood of this channel. We got our best friend, uh, Speed of Sound, who's changed his name to Answers in Atheism. Very, very creative. Um, I'm impressed, Speed. I'm impressed. Uh, it's almost two. It's almost two in the morning, Speed. You should be getting some sleep. So, guys, what we're going to be discussing today is uh, actually. And, and before I keep going, if I can get some feedback on the audio and video. I want to make sure there's no lagging or everything is coming through. Check my mic here. So we are going to be discussing uh, nested hierarchies, birds, dinosaurs, taxonomy, cladistics, all of those related topics, as well as feathered dinosaurs. And uh, I'll be giving my opinion on whether or not the evidence suggests that some theropod-like dinosaurs, whether or not they had feathers. So uh, the science news says, is this live? Yes, it is live. So, uh, it was kind of spur of the moment. I just, I just said it and pretty well went live right away. So a lot of people, uh, probably didn't get the notification. I apologize for that. I wasn't sure if I was going to stream tonight or not since, uh, pretty much the next five days. We've got either an interview, discussion, or debate, so it's gonna be it's gonna be busy. Why don't we get right into the topic, though? So what I want to do is I've I've got some slides, I've got a presentation that I want to uh, give to everybody to go over this topic. Okay, um, but first I want to point out something that's very important before we get into kind of the meat of this topic. Okay, because I want to point out that in terms of in terms of phylogeny, taxonomy, and let's just say classification systematics in general, okay? Um, a paleontologist, for example, would tell you that birds or avians are indeed dinosaurs, okay? We've all heard this over and over again, okay? They would actually say, um, properly put, that birds are avian dinosaurs, okay? And more specifically, when it comes to other dinosaurs, they would be considered non-avian dinosaurs, okay? Now, uh, one, one thing I want to point out too that, that I've pointed out numerous times in shows is that these classification schemes, they're essentially man-made, okay? And very often they are subjective. Um, I really don't think that the bird cares much what it is classified as, okay? Nor does the non-avian dinosaurs. And when it comes to the fossil record, it's difficult without the genetics. I constantly point out the fact that it is our genes, traits, and genetics that are inherited sperm and egg, okay? Not a rock, not a bone, not a fossil, not geography, but genetics. So oftentimes a fossil without the genetics, of course, can be deceiving, especially because of things such as convergent evolution, okay? There's oftentimes more variation within a species than across species. So that's a problem with the fossil record because oftentimes it's difficult to determine what is the result of convergent evolution and what is not, okay? When you hear shared derived synapomorphies, okay, which just means shared derived characteristics or traits, the derived is assumed to be derived. Okay, because when it comes to taxonomy and nested hierarchies, okay, the fact that there is a nested hierarchy doesn't necessarily demonstrate relationship. Okay, it just demonstrates the fact that there exists nested hierarchies in the biological world. That's the structure of life. Okay, um, before I go on too many rabbit trails, because <laughs> this topic, I mean, I want to try and keep this within the hour. So, um, I'm going to try and keep it as few rabbit trails as possible. Um, let me see. George, thank you, brother. George is going to be with us tomorrow. I appreciate these as no answers in atheism. Very true. Very true. I appreciate the $5 super chat. George is going to be here tomorrow for the, um, for the presentation with professor David McQueen. So lots of fun. Looking forward to that. Um, 
here's the thing before I get into the slides, okay? Another thing is proponents of dinosaur to bird evolution. What they say is that birds essentially have evolved from a group of specifically meat-eating dinosaurs, okay? These are known as the theropods. And the Tyrannosaurus rex, okay? All of our favorite dinosaur from Jurassic Park would belong to this group. Um, would belong to this group of dinosaurs. Okay, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna screen share in a minute and we're gonna go over the different groups of dinosaurs and just a few other important aspects uh, related to this topic for us to best understand it, okay? Um, now, even though the Tyrannosaurus rex is part of that same group, okay, of theropods, they would say that birds essentially evolved from smaller theropods. And really this whole classification aspect of this debate, okay, it, it kind of comes down to semantics, as you guys have probably noticed. Uh, for example, the evolutionists will say birds today are dinosaurs simply because birds are members of the dinosauria, okay? And so are theropods, which are a subset of dinosauria, okay? Uh, from my understanding, based on cladistic analyses, there's actually a group of reptiles called the thecodonts. And from them came dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and crocodiles, okay? And from dinosaurs came what? Well, came birds. So what that means is to the evolution and based on these cladistic analyses, okay, it is said that birds are then living dinosaurs, just based on the law of monophyly, okay, based on cladistics and, and taxonomy and descent with modification. Um, they'll just say birds are living dinosaurs because... All that defines a dinosaur, okay, in terms of internal um, skeletal structure, skeletal similarities, for example, uh, even behavior, they'll say, is, is found in, in birds as well, okay? The same thing that would define a dinosaur. Um, so in terms of whether or not birds are dinosaurs, to the evolutionist, when considering taxonomy, cladistics, okay, nested hierarchical patterns and the structure of life, it would be like asking whether or not a Ford Mustang is a car. Well, yes, a Ford Mustang is a car, okay, but not all cars are Ford Mustangs. In the same way that it is claimed all birds are dinosaurs, but not all dinosaurs are birds, of course. Um, I hope this is making sense, but it's good to... Um, I feel it's important to represent the evolutionist side, okay, before getting into the arguments, because there's nothing to worry about when it comes to taxonomy and classification schemes, okay? Yes, nested hierarchical patterns exist. No, these patterns do not demonstrate relationship. It doesn't demonstrate that uh, birds descended from, you know, non-avian theropod dinosaurs, okay? That's a whole different story. Um because as we know, and as I've pointed out earlier, the fact that that man-made classification schemes um, and these existence of nested hierarchies, which we both predict, does not actually demonstrate relationship. And that's the core. That's the bigger picture, okay? The existence of these hierarchies are predicted on both models. Using things like hierarchies or... Um, homology, mosaics, okay? These lines of observations are agnostic to the debate. It would be like me arguing with an evolutionist. Let's say I was arguing with speed of sound and I said, speed, okay? The sky is blue. It's a fact, therefore creation's true. He'd say, you're crazy. You're crazy because the evolutionary model can also explain why the sky is blue or why the earth is a sphere. Okay, these are just agnostic lines of evidence that aren't really going to get us anywhere since both models can predict the data, both models expect the data. Okay, so I wanted to go over these basics before I get into some slides here. Uh, see how the chat's doing. Yes. Yeah, George, almost 500,000 views. Should get there by the end of the week. I think so. We're going to have a 500,000 view party. <laughs> I think we're at like... Um, 499,000 and like 600 views. So we might even be there by tomorrow. Okay, so um, let me see. 
I'll, I'll, I'll save some of these questions. How can meat eating dinosaur, a very big percentage evolve into bird whose bones have air pockets in them? Um, so they'll say that uh, based on inference, okay? Cause a lot of these soft tissues, they're not preserved, but they'll say that some of your theropod like dinosaurs had similar lung systems as birds today, modern birds today. They'll say that they had similar air sacs Okay, and they'll even say that the function would have been though for these theropod dinosaurs, kind of like an ostrich. Okay, they run at a, in incredibly high speeds and they would have uh, had well-designed lung systems for this. Even the, even the sauropods, some of your other dinosaurs, which uh, we're gonna get to in a little bit, they say had those same lung systems because you can have the same design, the same structure, okay, which is, used for different different things like for example just look at a shoe i mean you've got a hundred different types of shoes where overall it's designed for your feet for walking but you've got a crossfit shoe wrestling shoe golf shoe runner shoe walking shoe all different types of shoes for all different types of purposes okay uh, but still the the same underlying structure right? The shoe is essentially still built the same. All your shoes have the same similarities. And um, at the core, they're essentially the same with, with variation. So um, let's get into a couple slides here. Caleb. Caleb, if you had chicken today, that means you had dinosaur for for uh, for dinner. So I hope it tasted good. David Neff, good to see you. David Neff is going to be here on... Uh, Friday debating whether or not the Ark was found in Turkey on Mount Ararat. So that's going to be fun. Okay, guys. So now that we got through to uh, just some of the basics when it comes to nested hierarchies, classification schemes, taxonomy, cladistics, I'm going to go through some slides here. Okay. I've also got a number of papers and um, I'm going to show both sides because, you know, we on this specific topic, uh, once we get into like whether or not there are some dinosaurs, some theropod dinosaurs that had um, that had feathers, you know, the Bible doesn't say one way or another. So we should let the science speak for itself. Okay, and there are some uh, solid brothers in Christ and PhDs that are young Earth creationists that would say, yeah, there are some theropod-like dinosaurs that might have had. Uh, feather-like structures used for different types of functions. Okay. So we're gonna get into this. This is gonna be a lot of fun. Um, so I'm gonna share screen here. And I wanna make sure that, all right, here we go. Let's have some fun. I'm gonna have my phone nearby, just making sure audio is good too. I'll be looking from, okay. All right. It's going to be more laid back, guys. So any questions or anything, let me know as well. And like I said, it shouldn't worry anybody, especially in the pre-flood world. Oftentimes I find there's an assumption that we make. We're guilty of assuming uniformitarianism, okay? And what I mean by that is, we're making the mistake of assuming that the present is, is the key to the past. Well, just like the biblical model says, there would have been populations at, cre at creation that were uh, created in fully functioning ecosystems, okay? And those ecosystems would have been different than today's ecosystems, okay? We can't look to the ecosystems of today and assume that's how it was in the pre-flood world. Plus, the pre-flood world would have had different elevations, Okay, different communities, different ecosystems of, of animals would have been essentially separated. And that's why burial through ecosystem, uh, ecological zonation is what it's called. Okay, um, I would say best explains the order of, of the fossil record. Okay, and the same thing would go for the oceans. You know, you'd have different ecosystems there. So the same thing goes with the types of animals we see today. For example, when we look at vertebrates, you'll see. Um, mammals, reptiles, okay, you'll see birds, uh, we can look to fish, okay, these different groups of animals. And they're pretty easy to look at and see the boundaries, okay? So we assume that looking in the fossil record, looking in the fossils themselves, we kind of assume it's going to be the same. It's going to be easy to tell, 
you know, what this creature is. But what we know about the pre-flood world, what we know about the starting point of design diversity, okay, the fact that God would have front-loaded Adam and Eve with these functional DNA differences, this pre-existing nuclear heterozygosity, which would apply to all the created kinds, okay, there would have been a lot more diversity, a lot more biodiversity in the pre-flood world. Even today, you can look at, just take a, a rhino, you know, you, there's an incredible amount of variation within just a single species today. You've got rhinos with small horns, big horns, no horns, <laughs> essentially, uh, you can line anything up the way you want it, okay? And when you pick up these bones and you see these amazing creatures in the pre-flood world, you see how incredibly diverse it was, especially if the pre-flood world was 90% green and only say 10% water versus today, which is the opposite. The real estate's essentially been completely rearranged, okay? So it makes sense. And we're just starting to recognize design, okay? The characteristics of design. And humans build, as we've discussed, humans build uh, transitional-like forms. I mean, try classifying a crossover SUV, which has characteristics of an SUV in a van or an amphibious assault vehicle. Hard to classify design objects exist. And, and they also exist in, in the biological world. So amazing diversity in, in the pre-flood world. Um, and God could have essentially created any types of creatures um, that he wanted. So I, I want to first go over the evidence claimed by the, check the, all right. Chat looks good. Okay. So have a drink here. So point is, it's not always going to be easy to classify animals, but there has been a lot of work done. For example, Dr. Um, McLean, PhD paleontologist, he's going to be here next week to discuss the so-called uh, mammal-like reptiles that your James Downard loves. He's written a book on it, and he's going to go over some of his technical work in terms of baromenology, which shows barriers. Okay, which shows barriers in the fossil record in terms of dinosaurs, the mammal-like reptiles, which points us back to the created kinds. It's exactly what we would expect given created kinds. So he's going to be discussing that, and I'm really, really excited. So here, here's the best evidence that I've found studying this. Okay, and I've studied this quite intently, especially um, recently. So they'll say, here's the best evidence you're going to find, okay, for feathered dinosaurs. Let's get right into this first. So what you'll find is what appears to be feathery-like integuments, okay? These integuments appear to contain melanosomes and melanocytes, okay? And I'm going to go over uh, what this these terms are in a bit, similar to scales and feathers. They also contain beta keratin, like dermal scales and lizards and feathers. They appear to uh, resemble plumulaceous feather, okay, versus, um, we're going to get into this in a bit, but there's different types of feathers, okay, and the ones that they're finding are not necessarily your panaceous feathers, they're your, um, they're more bristle-like, more um, hair-like, kind of like you'll find in, in a chick, okay, um, these appear to be pig, pigmented. They may or may not contain collagen. We're going to get into this. The presence of collagen is claimed is claimed as what should be found if, say, they were torn up skin. Other hypotheses is, is what these structures could be. We'll, we'll go into this. The pigments appear to look like bird feather pigment, and they are said to be hollow, which is characteristic of hair, but not of skin or torn up tissues. Okay. So first off, what if some dinosaurs had feathers? Well, let's get this out of the way first. This would not be a problem for the biblical creation model, okay? As it would be a line of evidence agnostic to the debate, just like your nested patterns, just like your homology, um, just like your so-called mosaics, okay? This means both models can explain the existence of feather-like structures in other animals besides birds. This especially goes for, as I was discussing earlier, the pre-flood world, which was far more diverse, okay? Mainly, it would not be a problem, since feather-like structures can serve numerous purposes and functions, okay? A feathered dinosaur could use feathers for what? Protection, warmth, for show, 
okay, for mating, um, for camouflage, number of different functions. And there are numerous types of feathers. This is what I was talking about in the last slide. Most people, when they think of a feather, they think of what is called a panaceous feather, okay? Your, your, your fully functional flight feathers, typically people think of. But many of the so-called feathered dinosaurs are claimed to have had single or, or a few bristle type stru uh, structures similar to, something similar to hair, as I was saying earlier, such as uh, what you'd see on, on like a chick, okay? Now, um, here's, here's some uh, brief explanation, some definition on, on some of these terms, okay? For example, keratin is, is one of a family of um, structural proteins, okay? And um, it, the keratin is found in scales, hair, nails, feathers, horns, claws, hooves, okay, a, a number of things, which means it's not simply and only indicative of feathers, okay. Um, melanosomes, well, a melanosome is an organelle found in animal cells and is the site for synthesis, storage, and transport of melanin, okay, the most common light-absorbing pigment found in the animal kingdom. They're responsible for color, photo protection, for example, in animal cells. In many species of fish, amphibians, crustaceans, and reptiles, these melanosomes can be highly mobile within the cell in response to hormonal control, okay? And um, I wanted to go over this one. When it, at a microscopic level, feathers are made of a protein called beta keratin, but the same protein also forms the beaks and claws of birds and the scales and shells of reptiles. Okay. So the point is what we're seeing here, these elements, okay, these building blocks are not always indicative of only a feather. Okay. And, and that's important to consider here as we move on. Okay, I do want to show a couple of clips actually before I go any further, but feathers on dinosaurs, okay? Um, there's good arguments on both sides and I want to be humble in this. I'm leaning towards probably not. And we're going to go over why. We're going to cover some of these reasons why. Um, their best arguments, I think, at this point in time, don't quite qualify as confirmation, okay? And, and we're going to address that. So. Um, and I've got books from, or I've got uh, papers from the, the secular side and the creationist side, because people are going to say, oh, Dr. David Menton, he's a creationist. Well, we'll have quotes and we'll look at papers from both sides. So what he said in, in a newer book, he said, there is no compelling evidence that the fine filaments seen on some dinosaurs are feathers of any kind and may actually be evidence of collagen fibers and ligaments and skin. Okay. Um, as we were talking about earlier, when it comes to dinosauria, okay, they'll look to certain structures. For example, they look to, uh, when it comes to a dinosaur, okay, in order to identify, like you were to pick up a bone and you wanted to identify whether or not this was a true dinosaur, a hip bone, okay, an important dinosaur in synapomorphy is the perforate acetabulum, okay? That's simply put, it's a hip bone, uh, actually three connected bones together called the pelvis with a hole in the center where the head of the femur sits, okay? So this is uh, indicative of, of a dinosaur, for example, just like there's traits and characteristics that are indicative of, say, a mammal, okay? So I just, it was important to go over that. But the dinosauria contains two major groups of dinosaurs, okay? The bird hip dinosaurs, Ornithischia, and the lizard hip dinosaurs. Saurischia. Now, what's funny is, okay, before I move on, the evolutionists will say that birds today actually evolved from guess, from guess what? Was it the bird hip or the lizard hip? No, they'll say birds evolved from the lizard hip dinosaurs. So what they have to invoke is convergent evolution, okay? That the structures, okay, the bird hip evolved twice independently. And we know every time convergent evolution is invoked, they, it, it is an admittance into the lack of uniqueness of the phylogenetic tree. Okay, so here's just some other uh, differences in regards to these uh, two types of 
categories, okay? Uh, so I just wanted to point out it is the lizard hip dinosaurs that they say birds evolved from, okay? So here we go. Convergent evolution. Dinosaurs have long been classified by the structure of their hip. The two branches are the lizard hip dinosaurs and the bird hip dinosaurs. Interestingly, as I was pointing out, okay, it appears that bird evolution was from the wrong type, the lizard hip theropods. Barrett noted, confusingly, bird hip dinosaurs are only distantly related to birds, whereas the direct ancestors of birds are found to, are to be found among the lizard hip dinosaurs. Okay, it's, uh, it's also said, uh, confusingly though, these bird ancestors were members of the order Saurischia, which is the lizard hip dinosaurs, not the Ornithischia, bird hip dinosaurs, okay? As we might expect from the names of uh, alone. So evolutionists are forced to believe that hips, diagnostic of birds, evolved at least twice, despite the complete lack of fossil evidence for such an evolutionary swerve. So we know what a problem uh, convergent evolution is. I want to go to um, some slides here. And I'm going to see how the chat's doing, make sure the sound's good, since I can't really see. Okay, it looks like we've got a good chat going. Young Earth creation in the house. George, my man. Okay. Baptist Chad, good to see you. Good to see you. Let me know if the sound, everything's good. One thing, actually, that I want to point out is the number of species we see today of birds in general. Okay, if birds truly did evolve from theropod like dinosaurs, let's say 300 million years ago, okay, true birds are actually found where they should not be found, which is why the evolutionists, there's something called the grandfather paradox, okay, and evolutionists have to keep pushing back the origin of birds, okay, but the more they push it back, the more of a problem it becomes, especially because uh, when we look to the number of species today, there's between 10 and 18,000. Uh, testable predictions have been made by young earth creationists. I've had debates upon debates on this and we should be seeing 500,000 to a million species of birds roughly. And this is even accounting for extinction events because typically they're rebuttal. Uh, Rom Ad and I debated a zoologist herpetologist on this and he brought up extinction events. You know, you're not accounting for extinction events. And even with generous um, amounts of extinction episodes, okay, there's still far too few bird species, especially because, and I've got paper upon paper here where new bird species have evolved before our very own eyes, okay, where the numbers line up perfectly to um, 4,500 years ago with the ark, okay, and a few bird kinds coming off of the ark. We're looking at predictions of roughly two to three new bird species a year. We're seeing rapid, rapid adaptation and speciation events today. I've got a bunch of papers over here if I can find them. But if birds really did evolve from theropod-like dinosaurs, okay, hundreds of millions of years ago, then there are far too few bird species. And that's why the evolutionists, because they'll invoke um, extinction events, they'll invoke a number of excuses, rescue devices. And it's funny because people like Dan are always saying, show me the numbers, show me the numbers. And yet we say the same thing when it comes to the number of species, okay? The number of species in lizards, birds, okay? Snakes, bats, okay? All, all forms of life fit perfectly with the young earth creation model, all coming from archetypes off the ark 4,500 years ago. We've actually made testable predictions with numbers. And yet the evolutionists have these rescue devices with no numbers. No numbers, just rescue devices, which means it's pseudoscience, which means it's pseudoscience. So um, anytime convergent evolution is, is invoked, which is um, just had a recent debate on nested hierarchies with uh, a rational empiricist, okay? It is admitting, as I said earlier, to a lack of uniqueness in the phylogenetic tree because it shows that there are inconsistencies, okay? Especially in, in structures, okay? Highly complex structures, like let's say the eye, for example, or echolocation systems that they now have to say, okay? They have to say that these highly complex systems and structures evolve multiple times. I mean, 30 times, for example, uh, in terms of the eye. When it comes to nested hierarchies as well, incomplete lineage sorting is a problem for them. So, you know, I just wanted to point out that when it comes to 
bird evolution. They, they have to invoke convergent evolution there too. So here's another uh, group of papers about rapid evolution that we're seeing far too quickly for deep time evolution, okay? They never expected this, right? Evolution takes time, speciation takes time. But now we know through epigenetics, these built-in mechanisms, okay, that are in there, millions of switches in the genome, just ready to be turned on or off through environmental conditions, environmental triggers, okay? All expected given the design diversity uh, hypothesis. So, uh, and the and the fact that we see such overlap as well in the fossil record. I'm going to play a quick clip actually here. So let me um, I'm going to stop sharing. And this overlap is exactly what we would expect. Okay, given the flood model, given the post flood period. Okay, like with the, um, for example, with your so-called hominids, your Australopithecines, okay, Neanderthal, Erectus, Floresiensis, Nelidae, you see Heidelbergensis, you see significant overlap in the fossil record, which is exactly what we'd expect in that they have existed, existed at the same time. It's exactly what we see with uh, birds and theropods, okay? So I want to share screen here, but I'm gonna share my audio for just a quick video on the grandfather paradox. And I am going to turn my volume down. So let me know you guys can hear it. Found in Poland, long before they were supposed to have evolved, and all of a sudden Tiktaalik was dethroned as a transitional fossil because again, the dates are all out of order. Hey everybody, I'd like you to meet my grandpa. Oh, so cute. Is is that his name or? No, his name is Seymour. He is my grandpa. What? Doesn't make any sense. Back to the chronologically ordered series of fossils, the Cilosaurus and Dorodon are considered fully aquatic whales. They're not a birds with the fossil Archaeopteryx. Oh, that's so spooky. The fossil record often reveals fossils out of the order that they're supposed to be in. For just a couple of other examples, let's take a look at bird evolution. It's supposed to go theropod dinosaurs evolving into birds, with the fossil Archaeopteryx being evidence of this as an intermediate fossil. But the problem is he appears long before the dinosaurs he was supposed to have descended from. Evolution also got a big stick in its spokes with this guy, Tiktaalik, a fish-like creature that Okay, so um, I want to read something here with this grandfather paradox, okay? So when it comes to the dating of these so-called ancestors, okay, the feathered dinosaur ancestors, even Sinoceropteryx, okay, and Archaeopteryx, they're dated as millions of years older than their alleged dinosaur ancestors. Um, even uh, Alan Fiducia, a well-known critic of the dino to bird dogma, often quips that you can't be older than, than your grandfather, okay? So, and, and this is what they typically respond with. Uh, let me check how the audio is. Um, you guys can hear me? Okay. So, uh, dino to bird believers respond that sometimes a grandfather can outlive his grandson. But while correct, it's hard to understand that an, an advanced beak bird okay, like Confucianorsis could appear 10 million years before there is a trace of feathered dino ancestors. Also, one of the major evidences of evolution is how the evolutionary order supposedly matches the fossil sequence. Therefore, the gross mismatch with the dino birds is a severe challenge to the evolutionary explanation. Now, the point is, the point is they may have an explanation for it, okay? Because they're always going to force fit or retrofit it into their story. But what we're seeing in terms of overlap and coexistence, it's just like their evidence for human evolution. It's exactly what we'd expect given our model, overlap, okay, and coexistence, okay? And not necessarily the evolution from one form to the other, okay? So that's the point. That's the point is what we're seeing is what we expect. Um I want to play a quick video here just to show, okay, this is when we had paleobiologist uh, Joseph Hubbard on, just to show that the evolution itself, okay, from a non-avian dinosaur to a bird, 
is impossible given the change or direction that we see in terms of mutations, in terms of natural selection. And we're not seeing anatomical novelty. We're not seeing the origin of phenotypic complexity, the origin of novel body plans. Okay, so I want to show a quick clip here that we had, and then we'll get into the other slides. But George, I'll, I'll say this and then I'll yield the mic for a bit because I could probably sum up 20 questions that have come in into this one question as to what are your thoughts, Joe, of the whole dinosaur to bird idea and more specifically, um, the claim that dinosaurs have have feathers. Is there any validity to these ideas and, and claims? Okay. Um, so sort of a two-part question. Let's deal with the dinosaurs to birds, first of all. Again, biblical perspective. Again, there's another whole presentation. We have to do this again sometime because we've got uh, so many to say about it. But but um, dinosaurs to birds, biblical perspective, uh, dinosaurs by their very definition are land animals. Um, they walk on the land and they have legs that go straight down underneath them. Therefore, according to the Bible, they were created on day six of creation. Birds by definition fly, therefore, uh, or at least are, are sort of uh, aerial birds, uh, aerial creatures. Therefore, by definition, they were created on day five of creation. So created on separate days according to the Bible. So again, make sure your Bible is your authority. Make sure the word of God is your authority and uh, take a biblical perspective on it. So according to the Bible, no, absolutely, birds are not, um, did not evolve from dinosaurs. Okay, now look at a scientific perspective. Uh, again, there's been no such thing as a, there, are, there have not been um, any specific under disputed transitional forms found. We can deal with uh, Archaeopteryx, for instance. Um, it's completely a bird that was proved by the Natural History Museum in London a few years back when they actually took its brain out and studied its brain. Because the argument was, well, it's a bird that's halfway between a dinosaur and a bird because it has feathers, but it also has teeth and it has claws on its wings and so on and so forth. Well, none of those are unusual. We have birds with all of them today. Uh, it's just all condensed into one with Archaeopteryx. What they did is they actually extracted its brain um, out of the fossil itself and uh, ended up uh, basically showing this is a bird's brain. There's no doubt about it. But there's a lot more to creating a feather than just, uh, or creating a bird than just sticking feathers on it, right? You have to redesign the entire thing. So you start off with a dinosaur, which is a reptile, which is cold-blooded. I worked as a zookeeper for six years. It was a nightmare keeping our animals warm because well, I worked primarily as a reptile zookeeper. Um, they require a lot of heat. Right? So you've got to turn a cold-blooded animal into a warm-blooded animal that actually has got a way of um, getting enough oxygen around and producing its own heat so that the blood can keep flowing in order to get oxygen enough while it, uh, so it can actually fly. Uh, then you need a breathing system because our breathing system is no good. A, a, a reptile's breathing system is even worse. So you've actually got to get a breathing system which injects oxygen into the bloodstream both on the intake of air and on the outtake of air. So they have a, a special sort of double-barreled lung system uh, where we breathe in and oxygen goes to the blood, we breathe out and we get rid of oxygen and then we breathe in again and so on and so forth. Whereas the double barrel system in the bird's lungs uh, is constantly delivering oxygen into the bloodstream. So very, very clever. Then you need to get rid of the bra uh, brain, a rep get rid of a reptile's brain, replace it, um, bird's brain, which is a phenomenal thing. So in other words, in order to turn a reptile like a dinosaur into a bird, you need to have an incredible, an incredible amount of new information uh, implanted. Now, one thing we've never seen is any kind of mutations creating new information. They can delete information, they can change around information that's already there, the vast majority of that uh, actually destroys a creature, but uh, they cannot make new information. That comes back onto the question of, well, what is a design? And how would you recognize whether something was designed? Now, the very definition of design is uh, if an object or a end, uh, design or uh, uh, something has got properties which do not come from the original material source, then that thing has been designed. So a very easy example is an aeroplane. What is an aeroplane? It's a 100% flying object made out of 100% non-flying parts. Each constituent material um, does not have the inherent uh, property of flight. However, the end product plane has got properties that do not come from the material parts, therefore it's been designed, right? What is a car? A car is a 100% moving object made out of 100% non-moving parts. What is a computer code? Well, a computer code is ones and noughts, right? Um, by themselves, they have no inherent information. They certainly don't make a computer code unless somebody who is cleverer than the computer code, who existed before the computer code um, and uh, is far smarter than the computer code, actually made those ones and noughts do what those ones and noughts do not do by themselves. You design a computer code, right? The end product, the code, has properties which do not exist in the materials that it is actually made of. All right, well, what is the uh, inside? Uh, what would majorly need to change in order to turn uh, dinosaurs into birds? Answer their DNA. Well, what is DNA? It's sugars, phosphates, carbons, and nitrogens. Each one of those things you probably ate for your breakfast, right? Um, on their own, they do not have the inherent um, property of DNA. They're just, you know, on their own, they, they, they just don't code for anything. However, DNA is perhaps the most complex coding system that the, we've ever come across uh, ever. It comes nowhere, you know, our computer codes in our systems nowhere close to DNA in terms, of, um, in terms of condensing the information, the amount of information. Yet DNA can also repair itself, and DNA can also replicate itself. 
the end product has properties which do not come from the original source, therefore DNA is designed by definition. By the way, DNA is actually designed to not evolve because the driving factor of evolution is supposedly uh, mutations and then natural selection gets rid of the bad mutations and uh, leaves the good ones, right? But inside every single one of your cells, including inside every single living organism, um, your DNA has a special property which means it uh, corrects mutations. Now, we live in a fallen world, so it doesn't always... So I'd like to I'd like to point out their mechanisms of change for the most part. Natural selection acting upon random variation. That random variation, that genetic diversity the natural selection is acting upon comes through, comes from mutations. What we know about the deleterious nature, the deleterious effect of mutations, okay? This change is not possible because it puts shelf lives on genomes, okay? And we don't see this type of anatomical novelty. But I want to point out before I finish this, because I wanted to go over the Archaeopteryx real quick. Uh, he brought up Archaeopteryx, and there's been a couple rebuttals to what he's saying. Um, for one, the brain in every way, shape, and, and form shows that Archaeopteryx was a bird, okay? Now... Uh, let's see the chat. I want to go back to the slides. Okay. Our, go our goth in the house. Okay, so here we go. Share screen. All right. So I'm going to go to the slides here. And... Okay. So... First off, when it comes to these, okay, these melanosomes, where if you if you remembered in the beginning, one of the main arguments had to do with the existence of melanosomes and melanocytes in these integuments, okay, but this was. Alan Fiducia himself actually pointed out, a longtime skeptic of dinosaur feathers. Alan Fiducia of the University of North Carolina. Fiducia claims Benton's team makes a leap of faith, okay? And noted that the melanosomes could be from skin, not feathers, or that the melanosomes could even be misidentified bacteria. So the point is, the point is, what they're finding doesn't necessarily have to indicate feathers, okay? And Fiducia himself has even responded to that, okay? And another thing is when it comes to these filaments, okay? Because they're saying, so here's the best arguments you can find, okay? And I'm not saying that these arguments aren't indicative of some theropod-like dinosaurs having feathers. I'm just saying there are alternatives and the evidence isn't irrefutable is the point, okay? Um, because they'll say that collagen, the presence of collagen is, is what should be found, okay? If the non-feather idea or hypothesis is, is true. But it's actually pointed out when you actually look at the whole picture, whether these filaments were okay, made of collagen, keratin, or some other substance, whether they were originally connective tissue within the dermis or some sort of filamentous skin appendages, the point is they are not the evolutionary ancestors of feathers. They exist as the minuscule filamentous remnants of something in or on the skin of some dinosaurs. And nothing about them demonstrates evolutionary progression to genuine feathers. Um, because right here is Dapper Dino. This was his debate with Ken Hoven. He said to debunk Fiducia and their work, okay, he said that the melanosomes, the existence of them is indicative of the feathers being preserved, okay, and some of these so-called feather dinosaur ca candidates like Sinoceropteryx, for example, is a big one, okay? But as we pointed out earlier, even Fiducia himself has responded saying that these could be from skin, not feathers, or could even be misidentified bacteria. And there's a paper here. So I'm going to go here. This is from Secular Sources, okay? So I definitely recommend... So right here, okay? 
the Journal of Ornithology, the Evolution of the Feather, Sinoceropteryx, a Colorful Tail. Okay, so if you read through it, they say it right in the abstract in that the allegations, okay, of these types of melanosomes in Sinoceropteryx are shown to be without scientific merit. Okay, so there's actually been a study showing that what they are saying, okay, these structures are indicative of, have actually also been found in ichthyosaurs. Okay, you can find other um, papers describing, I think I have it here, these same types of uh, structures and integuments are found in dolphins, okay, found in sharks. I mean, nobody's going to say an ichthyosaur or a pterosaur or a shark or, or, or a dolphin had feathers. So that's my point is there are some discrepancies as in this isn't just a, a, a knockout or knockdown case. Okay, so here's one, the dinosaurian origin of feathers. And let me see, I had the full thing open before. And this goes over the collagen fiber hypothesis, okay? And the fact that, here, right here, ichthyosaurs and... Since collagen is the main fiber type found in most supporting tissue tissues, the results have a wide implication. So, and that's the point, right? What we're finding, beta keratin, melanosomes, um, even if, it, whether it is or isn't collagen that's being found, okay? None of these things are just 100% indication that what we're looking at is feathers, especially when it comes to the quill mobs, which we'll talk about later, okay? And the rebuttal to these arguments, before I go to ha have have been responded to and not necessarily debunked because as fiducia pointed out they could be from skin or even from some uh, unidentified bacteria okay so here's there's one part I wanted to find for you guys with the study they did on on a um, on Dolphins right here. Okay, so they tested this hypothesis, okay, of the alleged fe uh, feathers, okay, the hypothesis that they're not really um, feathers or, or feather-like structures. They tested it using light microscopy, okay, collagen from the hypodermis and subdermal connective tissue sheath was examined from a dolphin that had been buried for a year as part of an experiment, okay? Now the point is, and, and you can read through this paper, is it's very interesting that these same type of fibers, these same type of structures were found in the dolphin, okay? And nobody would say that dolphins had, had feathers, of course. Um, so that kind of addresses that argument, but, um, there's one thing here that I wanted to, okay. So right here. Once again, melanosomes to the rescue, right? And this is Dapper Dino. That's his slide, his main argument from Kent's debate. Let me check the chat real quick. Alec Cox, I appreciate it. I appreciate it, brother. That's awesome. Support, like I said, you guys are the life and blood of this channel and your amazing support is why we are able to host interviews, discussions, debates nearly every single day. So um, I appreciate it. Yeah, Alec Cox, Archaeopteryx was a bird. So I'm going to get into some of their rebuttals to that and then how to um, properly address it. So, so right here, they claimed, right? So it's been claimed that these organelles, okay, called eumelanosomes, okay, these different types of melanosomes in the Sinoceropteryx specimen, okay, they're saying that this is, uh, which, which produce the very dark eumelanin and reddish brown pheomelanin pigment in feathers. But through this secular paper in this study, they showed evidence against that claim, okay, and they stated, university, of KwaZulu Natal, South Africa. Okay, optical illusion created 
when the SEM, the, the scanning electron micrograph is reproduced at low image size. And in a recent paper, the author here has provided further evidence against this claim. Okay. Um, oh, let me see if I can go here. Now, what, what Joseph Hubbard was saying about the Archaeopteryx, okay? The fact that Archaeopteryx certainly has a number of unambiguous bird features, okay? The perching foot, classical elliptical wings, fully formed flying feathers, right? Including asymmetric veins and ventral reinforcing furrows, as in modern flying birds. The wishbone, large wishbone. So they've said, as a rebuttal, that the, the perching foot, okay, which indicates, right, because this means that its wings would have needed to be sophisticated enough to produce the special wing turbulences, okay, like those of modern birds, so that it could land delicately on a branch. So they're saying that based on further analyses and assessment, okay, it did not have a perching foot, okay? Well, even this has been addressed too, okay? So... Here's a rebuttal here. Many evolutionists emphasize its reptilian features, but these are overstated. For instance, no modern birds have teeth, but some fossil birds do. And remember how we were talking about the, the, the pre-flood world, okay? And the amazing biodiversity found in the pre-flood world, especially given the design diversity hypothesis where at creation, you had the greater potential for diversification simply because those DNA differences are built in from the start and therefore recombination gene conversion can lead to rapid change, rapid adaptation, rapid variation in literally a single generation. Is it any surprise that we find such amazing biodiversity in the fossil record? This is all indicative of God's amazing design and his forethought, okay? So uh, some fossil birds do. Even some uh, dinosaurs did not have teeth, such as oviraptor, okay? Also its teeth are bird-like and not those of reptiles. Thus the teeth themselves are not conclusive. And being an extinct bird, this is not surprising. Fiducia himself stated that Archaeopteryx was much more bird-like in many features than has been previously thought. Its wing claws are not indicative of reptilian status either. Some young birds, especially flightless birds, have claws on their wings when young, including the Hawatsin and the young of the Taraco. Its tail was reptilian, but a number of extinct birds, including some of the so-called feathered dinosaurs, have they're more like a stick, okay? And they have long tails that are extensions of their vertebra, like Archaeopteryx, okay? So this perching foot argument, okay, that I've seen, okay? It didn't really have a perching foot. So let's address this. Other features place this fossil squarely within the family of birds. Archaeopteryx had bird-like claws. Fiducia analyzed the curvature of the hind claws and concluded that their curvature was similar to claws in modern perching birds. Birds can have less curvature, but these are invariably ground dwellers. Archaeopteryx would have been ill-suited for running but well suited to gripping tree limbs. Its wing claws may have been used to climb tree trunks like a woodpecker. Several dinosaur to bird enthusiasts dispute this analysis, okay? And I've personally seen it. Saying that the Archaeopteryx hallux, the first toe which is opposed to the other three, is less than an optimal 180 degrees in the 10th specimen, making it a poor percher. However, modern perching birds exhibit these angles from 65 degrees to 180 degrees. Also, uh, Mayor Al ignored the curvature of the claws. So these have been addressed, okay? But what's important as uh, Hubbard, uh, Joseph Hubbard was talking about is Archaeopteryx had a brain and an inner ear just like a bird, okay? Check this out. An analysis of the brain and inner ear of Archaeopteryx showed that they were similar to birds. Here we show the reconstruction of the brain case from which we derived endocasts of the brain and inner ear. These suggest that Archaeopteryx closely resembled modern birds in the dominance of the sense of vision and then the possession of expanded auditory and spatial sensory perception in the ear. Um, okay, so here's some other candidates. Sinoceropteryx, for example. Okay, that's the one we were touching on earlier where they... Um, where they say that uh, Sinoceropteryx had clear evidence for feather-like structures, okay? But we've already discussed the, um, the nature of it and 
I like how they point out here um, a buckled dorsal skin crest like that in iguanas partly decayed, leaving skin fibers, not feathers at all. And we went over the melanosomes, okay, the, the fact that we find that. And the collagen, whether or not that's even found is not evidence that these are undoubtedly feathers, okay? So that's the point. That's the point, um, is the interpretation could very, very well be erroneous. And here's the thing, guys, here's the thing. When it comes to nested hierarchical patterns, okay, I'm going to um, go into another document here. Okay, since both models predict these patterns, by definition, by definition, let's take humans, for example, humans had to be more similar to some creatures and less similar to other creatures, okay? So what are we the most similar to? Well, the great apes. We're the most similar to chimpanzees. Okay, we're more similar to chimpanzees than we are to banana plants. We're more similar to old world monkeys than we are to whales, okay? So by definition, there has to be a hierarchy. And if you wanna classify things, then you will be able to group animals according to similarities, according to uh, characteristics, traits, genetics. And what we see just standing back is exactly what we'd expect anyways. Humans and chimpanzees are more similar to each other than humans and lizards or humans and fish, okay? Just like birds, by definition, have to be more similar to some creatures and less similar to others. So if birds, modern day birds, are most similar to, let's say, theropod-like dinosaurs, Okay, so from classification systematics or nested hierarchies, then birds can be nested within that group, okay? But it doesn't confirm or demonstrate relationship is the point, okay? Both models predict some type of hierarchy. A hierarchy exists. The evolutionists have the problems when it comes to incomplete lineage sorting, when it comes to loss of traits evolution, convergent evolution, okay? Nested hierarchical patterns are characteristics of design. Okay, humans accidentally build in these types of hierarchies. So we're just beginning to recognize characteristics of design. We are building transitional like forms. Okay, and the pre flood world would demand this type of diversity. Uh, let me check the chat real quick, make sure the audio is doing good. All right. So when it comes to the tail, actually, I did have a quick video I wanted to show here. Just one second, guys. Got a ton of papers here. All right, so I'm gonna show this video real quick on the, all right, I'm gonna share a screen. And here we go, guys, bear with me here. It's called Confuciornis Sanctus, uh, and it is supposed to be 125. Twenty-five million years old. I don't accept those days. This bird has every single feature we would see in a modern bird. That would include a crop, a syrinx, you name it. It even has some specialized tail feathers that sort of remind me of a... Uh, a fork tail uh, flycatcher. So feathers every part of the body, crop, gizzard, you name it, it's got it. And it's a bird. Here's 130 million, again, I don't accept these dates, 130 million year old bird that was found in that area recently. And uh, it's uh, Archae ornithra. And again, it has every component we would reasonably expect to find uh, in a bird, including feathers. But what about the feathered dinosaurs? That's what you're wondering about. This would be one of the feathered dinosaurs here, Zhenyang Long. And uh, it was found in that northeastern part of China, said to be 125 million years old. Notice it does indeed have a long tail. But notice again, the feathers come all the way into the bone and attach by ligaments to the bone. There is no muscle in this tail. All the vertebrae from here out are all linked together so we would form a solid rod 
and it would all sort of behave like uh, something solid that bent down at the base, like, like this, not bent along its length, but just from the base. Those were the only movable vertebrae, and we can see those movable vertebrae right in this region. The rest is a stick. So this is just like Archaeopteryx. It has a long tail. There's no weight to it. And look where the legs go and attach right here. This would never balance if it didn't walk from its knees. So uh, here you can see the feathers and the wing. I had our artist draw uh, this uh, so-called dromaeosaur, which is generally considered a dinosaur, as a bird. And that would balance. And this certainly looks like a sensacrum up in this area here. That would balance, but if you tried to stand it up so it walked like a dinosaur, bringing the balance point to the hip, it would fall on its nose. So I conclude that dromaeosaurs are birds, and that would include velociraptors, dinonychus, and microraptors. So when a dinosaur has feathers, it is a bird, and uh, birds are not dinosaurs. Uh, I hope I've convinced you of that. Well, let's uh, close. Uh, the Bible says in Matthew. <clears throat> All right, so you can see the tails themselves are also not necessarily indicative of what the uh, bird to dinosaur crowd are trying to are trying to say. Okay, now I wanted to just quickly look up here at the papers that I have listed. I'll put these in the. Um, in the description box as well for people that want to go down deep, stay down long, come up dry on this topic. Um, okay, so let me go back, back to here. And okay. Okay, so here is so a 2017 report, okay, disputed some of the work done on Sinoceropteryx. It uses higher resolution photography to demonstrate that some collagen fibers were actually preparation marks made by air scribes and others were actually tiny linear features of the sedimentary matrix. However, three Sinoceropteryx specimens do have very dark fibrous remnants. These may or may not represent collagen. Okay, so here, here's an important point to consider. Okay, guys, these may or may not represent collagen. Okay, because remember up here, one of the main arguments would be that for these not to be feathers, the presence of collagen is what should be found. But in light of all the data, in light of all the evidence, in light of all the studies that have been done, and these studies that are sh I'm showing you are from the secular side, okay? And they're not even all done by Fiducia, who they like to um, kind of just discard as if he doesn't have any good arguments. But he's responded. You know, he's he has responses to these. Um, now, it's funny watching the two crowds argue with each other because they both bring up valid points. And we're sitting here as biblical creationists saying, you're right, you both have good points because birds never evolved in the first place, <laughs> okay? Um these may or may not represent collagen, but nor do they likely represent feathers since feathers are branched and these fibers are not. Without real feathers, the animal would not fit a feathered dinosaur category. Okay. Um, okay. Collagen fibers. Although it is possible that the integumentary structures are decayed true feathers, there are some problems with that deduction. Fiducia and others have analyzed the claims of the feathered dinosaurs from China in some detail. They found experimental and fossil evidence that the fibers found along the outside of the skeleton of Sinoceropteryx and others are better explained as collagen fibers that were simply a part of the skin of the dinosaur. We also know that there are several dinosaurs with no claimed evolutionary link to birds. This is interesting. That also have these fibers. Okay, and it goes over a, a similar horned dinosaur to the um, cer Ceratopsians. Now, here's here's something important too, guys, I want you to notice. Um, let me check the chat real quick since I can't really look uh, when my slides are shared. Okay, nice to see we got a decent, we got a good audience of 20 here even at this time. 
All righty. Any questions or anything from the audience that uh, maybe I'm gonna, if you feel like I'm not addressing, then let me know. I'm trying to leave no stone unturned here. But I also want to point out, like I did at the beginning, okay, whether or not there are some theropod dinosaurs with, let's say, feather-like structures, okay, then it's not a problem since those types of structures, those types of designs, the evolutionists that have a problem explaining the evolution of a feather in general, this type of anatomical novelty and their claim mechanisms, mutations and natural selection are not gonna lead to that type of anatomical novelty, okay? Mutations put shelf lives on genomes, okay? And their whole story suffers from far too few species today of birds, if they supposedly descended from theropod-like dinosaurs, okay? Suffers from the grandfather paradox, suffers from a number of problems, okay? The overlapping is exactly what we would expect given our model. So here we go. Other types of fossil animals also show these bristle-like collagen fibers, such as a pterosaur, an ichthyosaur, and other reptiles or dinosaurs. So here's the point, guys. Consider this. If these bristle-like fibers, these types of structures being found in a lot of these so-called feathered dinosaurs and then they're being inferred to be feathers, if they're also found in things like creatures such as pterosaurs, ichthyosaurs, uh, dolphins, sharks, other types of dinosaurs that don't have feathers, then why do we have to necessarily conclude okay, that these so-called dinosaurs actually had feathers. When we know creatures, even creatures alive today, have the same types of, um, let's say, these bristle-like collagen fibers and other types of structures being found, we're going to get into the quill knobs soon in a bit, are found in creatures that don't have feathers. Okay, and that's what I mean. That's why it's, the evidence is just not as conclusive as, as they want to make it out to sound like. Now let's let the science speak for itself, of course, because it's it, it's still a, a, a line of evidence that's agnostic to the debate regardless, okay? The genetic data, the direct ways to determine ancestry absolutely demolishes universal common ancestry, okay? So therefore on this situation, in this scenario, we should just let the science speak for itself. Now it says, um, even collagen fibers from a dead dolphin were similar to the claimed proto feathers from China. Thus, these Fibrous structures cannot be considered unique to dinosaurs in the evolutionary chain leading to birds, which also supports the conclusion of Fiducia al. that they are simply collagen fibers. But remember, the argument that, well, they didn't actually find collagen when they looked deeper and they found the melanosomes and beta keratin, as we talked about earlier, all of these things are still not indicative of feathers. Okay, because they can be indicative of skin, unidentified bacteria, scales, a number of things, okay, other than feathers. And, and that's the problem is, is the arguments that I've seen, they are not 100% indication of the so-called feathered dinosaur idea, okay? And these quill knobs, these quill knobs, okay, this is important. Um, I'm just going to go to the chat real quick. And... Oh, here we go. Okay. See how the chat's doing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Brother Montas, some of these names, I'm telling you, I think they just try and make them impossible to say on purpose. <laughs> I should have given a dis I should have given a disclaimer at first. Hey, a lot of these words, you know, my uh expertise, if, if I were to have one, would be genetics, biology. The books I've written are on human evolution, independent origins. So this uh, this whole topic of archosaurs and dinosauria and some of these names that they give these dinosaurs, try and say those 10 times fast. Um, righty, so him say, good to see you. All right, so I really want to point out the... Okay. All right. So I'm going to share screen again. And here we go. So this one's important because this is actually um, an observation that I haven't seen. I haven't found anybody dealing with this. Uh, maybe I haven't looked hard enough, but 
we'll see. So these quill knobs, okay? Some researchers have granted feathered dinosaur status to fossils on the basis of quill knobs. These bone bumps occur as small, shallow tubercles along the rear ulna in birds that use powered flight. Each one anchors a ligament that attaches to the base of a large pinaceous feather. This system helps critical flight feathers resist the physical rigors of strong flight. Quill knobs and extant birds have regular sizes and maintain regular distances between one another, okay? So this is important because you've all seen the drastic change in velociraptors, okay? Especially if you've seen the raptors in Jurassic Park, now you see them fully feathered, okay? Looking like birds. And the evidence is pretty much based on this, okay? So check this out, guys. In contrast, the supposed quill knobs on the few feathered dinosaur candidates, okay? with forearm tubercles have more variations in size, show irregular spacing, and instead of a neat row along the rear, okay, the rear ulna, are oriented at different angles along the bone. This latter feature means that if the tubercles were quill knobs, their attached feathers would stick out in places unfit for wings and possibly unfit for anything. Extant non-avian bones can have small bumps, okay? Listen to this, extant non-avian bones, okay, can have small bumps for use as attachment points for sheets of connective tissue or tendons that have nothing to do with feathers. Nothing to do with feathers, guys. So do we, is it 100% necessary to then interpret, okay, these fossils as having these bumps for feathers? When we see that extant non-avian bones have pretty well the same thing for attachment points that are not even for feathers, right? So why must these fossil bone bumps carry quill knob status when they fail to match avian quill knobs? Now, here's the thing. Once again, I want to point out that we should be humble on this topic. I want to be humble on this topic. There's some men of God that I respect um, in the young earth creation field, including paleontologists who would hold to the position that some of these theropod dinosaurs had feathers. And like I said, it's not like there's no evidence, okay? Because what we're, what we're covering here, okay, those proponents of, of feathered dinosaurs, they would see these lines of evidence as good evidence to them that some of these theropod dinosaurs had feathers, okay? And that's all, all I'm doing is showing both sides. Personally, I'm not convinced, okay, based on the secular papers, based on these studies, these observations. I'm not 100% convinced either way. I'm leaning more towards the fact that they probably didn't have feathers. But if they did, it's okay. And it fits perfectly in a design hypothesis, fits perfectly in, in biblical creation. I'm just saying the evidence, as you're seeing, okay, especially in terms of what they would say is, is the most irrefutable evidence that these theropod dinosaurs had feathers. There are alternatives and there are problems. There are discrepancies, okay? It's not a, uh, a knockdown case is my point, okay? So, uh, but if people have different opinions on this specific topic, it's okay. You know, uh, differing views in say creation are healthy, different models, and um, different predictions and different opinions is, is kind of how we, we advance in terms of science, in terms of uh, creation. So uh, quill knobs do not occur on some gliding birds' bones today. Example, the albatross. So the feature is not diagnostic, uh, diagnostic of all birds. Some velociraptor forearms had bumps interpreted as quill knobs. So that's why you see there, uh, the interpretations, the drawings, the illustrations of these raptors, specifically Velociraptor, right? Because of these bumps now being interpreted as quill knobs, attachment points for feathers. Now you see them being illustrated as these birds, okay? Uh, but they also point out that most have no bumps there. And the bumps in general, as we've read up here, do not necessarily indicate attachment points for feathers is the point, okay? Um, there's a lot of interpretation when it comes to fossils, especially we don't have the genetics. Genetics is the direct way to determine ancestry, of, as we talked about, guys. Features that have equivocal interpretations like fibers and, and, and tubercles always seem to receive the most evolution-friendly options. 
of course, right? Because um, that's their basic assumption that birds have essentially evolved from dinosaurs, okay? Thus, evolutionary bias may have unduly influenced interpretations of fibers as feathers, okay, and shallow tubercles as quill knobs. Um, let me see what the next slide is here. Oh, and the T-Rex too, okay? You'll see pictures of T-Rex dressed up with, with feathers, okay? Looking more like a bird. Let me just check the chat real quick. Um, let me know everything's good, okay? Good to see everybody's having fun. Lively chat, okay. So you've probably seen the T-Rex illustrated this way. Well, from Science Mag, they examined the world's only known fossils of T-Rex skin far fr uh, from the neck. So I've heard people say, oh, you know, they only got skin from the neck. Well, according to this, they've got skin from the neck, the pelvis, and a tail, okay? And apparently this uh, specimen has been stored since 2006 at the Houston Museum of, of Natural Science, okay, in Texas. And guess what? They found no sign of feathers, just smooth, scaly skin. This isn't young earth creationists coming up with this. This is in the um, secular literature themselves. They found no sign of feathers, just smooth, scaly skin. They also analyzed skin impressions from large Tyrannosaurus that lived around the same time, okay, such as Albertosaurus and Gorgosaurus. Um, those dinosaurs were also covered in scales. Okay, and that's why when it comes to like these proteins, these structures, these elements, beta carotene, melanosomes, okay, collagen, you know, a, a lot of these um, elements that are found in scales, skin, hair, feathers, okay, you're not just automatically going to conclude that it has to only be feathers. No, it would also fit an animal with scales or skin. Okay, so that's important about the T-Rex, guys. Um, here's a few slides as well. And uh, one thing here on Sinoceropteryx. Um, okay, so with the modern shark skin, okay, they compared the fossils with modern shark skin. And um, the proto feathers are the remains of structural fibers that strengthen the skin. The random orientation of fibers is caused by breakages. And the regular pattern of the fibers show that Sinoceropteryx had a frill of skin along its neck, back, and tail. And once again, um, where they say that downy proto feathers claim to be evidence for evolution of feathers, okay? We went over that in the beginning. Well, collagen fiber structures are found on fossil ichthyosaurs, pterosaurs, and ornithischian dinosaurs that don't have feathers is the point, okay? Some furry pterosaurs have fibers which appear appear, um, appear to be hair-like. Um, okay, so let me see what the next slide is here. Leave no stone unturned. And then, it, and then it goes back to cladistics, okay? It goes back to the fact that they are basing a lot of their evidence. A lot of them are, um, a lot of your evolutionary paleontologists are dogmatic about birds evolving from dinosaurs because of comparative anatomy and classification systems, okay, uh, such as cladistics, okay, puts birds together with the theropod dinosaurs. But what was I saying earlier? By definition, every creature has to be more similar to some, less similar to others. Humans are more similar to plants than they are to chimpanzees. No, of course not. Humans are more similar to chimps than they are to plants. Okay, so the evolutionists will group us together with the primates. They'll group us together with the great apes. Okay, because when you're looking at morphology, anatomy, genetics, physiology, you are going to find similarities. It's when you look at the similarities and dissimilarities that you get a better picture. The evolutionists assume, okay, because they draw this circle so big where they're going to fit in birds, crocodiles, okay, okay dinosaurs. And they've got these groups like archosaurs, dinosauria. Okay, where it's a circle so big that everything that has such similarities in terms of anatomy, morphology, physiology, genetics, they can put them into that circle. Okay, and because the evolutionists assume everything is related in that circle, 
they are mainly focusing on the similarities and the dissimilarities, the differences, they'll just say have evolved independently, right? They'll say that birds have lost their teeth, evolved the beak, just like humans today, what makes them different in terms of anatomy and morphology, physiology and genetics have come about, okay, these novelties have come about since certain lineages have split. That's how they explain orphan genes, human specific endogenous retroviruses, Okay, it's how they explain anatomical novelties, morphological novelties. So they assume that everything in the circle is essentially related. We can make a circle and title it uh, land vehicles. And you're going to get, you're going to fit a ton of design modes of transportation in that circle. A circle you can, you can draw that's big enough, you can fit anything. It doesn't demonstrate relationship. It doesn't de demonstrate universal common ancestry, it just demonstrates that you can group things together, okay? And some of the same designs, like right here, steering wheel, okay? Same purpose, same underlying structure, okay? But different designs, different variations, depending on the car, depending on, on the design mode of, of transportation. So this is what we see in the, in the designed world. This is what we see in the biological world. And there's another slide here I wanted to show you guys as well in terms of, uh, see, this is important, okay? When evolutionists want to look to taxonomy, cladistic, nested hierarchical patterns in the structure of life as, check, how's the sound, guys? as evidence for universal common ancestry, they're assuming apparently that God would have created humans equally distant from all forms of life. Okay, equally distant from the great apes, equally distant from the great apes as they would be from whales, as they would be from banana plants. No, okay. God created the biological world with DNA, RNA, proteins, okay, similar structures. And therefore, the DNA that codes for those structures, the information system that makes life life, obviously, you're going to find similarities. You're also going to find differences. These patterns, and here's the thing, when they're doing these phylogenetic trees, they're assuming common ancestry. So when they find things like incomplete lineage sorting, where they can look at different genes, and depending on what gene they're looking at, what results is totally different phylogenetic trees, <laughs> obviously, they're going to explain them away. They're always going to retrofit the data because they're not questioning the tree. Okay, yeah, they can question little details of the overall big picture of universal common ancestry, okay? They can question the details, but not the bigger picture. So yes, when it comes to taxonomy, when it comes to grouping things, people group their, uh, classify their tools, group their tools. But guess what? You always come about with certain things like fencing pliers, which are designed with a multi-purpose design, incorporates, look at the number of things it incorporates. Where are you going to classify that? Right? You're going to put it here. You're going to put it here, put it here. There, you put it there. And apparently it's the perfect transition. Okay. So uh, there are some hard to classify designed objects in the same way that there are some hard to classify uh, creatures in the biological world, especially when you're looking at the fossil record which is reflection of that pre-flood world that was more diverse, okay? Um, the evolutionists never want to focus on the discrepancies to their phylogenetic tree because they'll oftentimes point to a possible discrepancy in a modes of transportation hierarchy. And then they're totally missing the point in the fact that, yes, a hierarchy exists. There are inconsistencies, okay? But overall, there is a hierarchy. Why is that hierarchy there? Why are birds more similar to, let's say, reptiles, specifically theropod type reptiles, than they are to humans or than they are to plants? Why are humans more similar to chimpanzees? Why are humans more similar to primates? Why can we group humans and great apes with the primates? Why are we vertebrates? Why are we eukaryotes? You know, these, these questions um, are not just indicative of universal common ancestry. You got to go to the differentiating lines of evidence. And that's why we focus on, especially the genetics. We focus on the uniparentally inherited DNA compartments, like the Y chromosome. We can look to the mitochondrial DNA. We can look to mutation accumulation, which 
puts shelf lives on genomes. Okay. Which means, which means non-avian dinosaurs did not evolve into modern day birds. And, and the number of species we see today, as we covered probably an hour ago, are not in line or consistent with, okay, the idea that birds today evolved from theropod like dinosaurs 300 million years ago. There should be way more species, way more species. You see Dr. Dan Kurt Stern Cardinal try and say, there's no way that the young earth creation model can explain all these species. And then critics like Dan Cardinal don't understand that there's not a lot of species to account for. And the species we do have, we're making predictions on, okay? And starting from the design diversity hypothesis and considering that we're seeing rapid change, rapid adaptation, rapid speciation today, which mind you is a result from shifts in heterozygosity to homozygosity. So it's opposite of what is required for large scale evolution, okay? When you're getting reductions in allelic variability. A wolf to a chihuahua is a loss of allelic variability. You're not going to take chihuahuas and get them back into a wolf. That's the point. Animals reach a wall. So in the pre-flood world, okay, we're looking back to the expansion of genetic information. Evolutionists are looking back to the contraction of genetic information. They're looking back to a single-celled like ancestor billions of years ago that evolved into a multi-celled ancestor that evolved into a fish, okay, an amphibian, a reptile into a mammal, into, uh, in, into essentially man, okay? So they are required to explain scientifically how that genetic information can be expanded, how phenotypic complexity can come about, how these novel body plans can come about. They can't explain this, okay? So I know I just ranted there. So let me go check the, the chat, see how everybody's doing. And I think we'll start winding it down, guys, because unless there's any last questions. Um, let's see. So we've been going an hour and a half, I said, try and get it done in an hour, but not, not too bad. Not too bad. You know, I think we're going to end it here. Um, I've, I've still got other videos, papers, articles that I can go through. But, you know, this is... Um, I, I think we've covered enough here uh, for people to look at both sides and come up with um, their own conclusion on the data, okay? And either way, it's, it, it would be agnostic to the debate as a whole, okay? And um, Will says, open the stream. Maybe we'll do, just to keep this specifically on this topic, um, maybe we'll do a, a, open it up to a separate one and discuss genetic entropy. Uh, we'll keep this one short and sweet. Not that an hour and a half is necessarily short and sweet, but okay, guys, this has been a lot of fun. Be here tomorrow. Professor McQueen will be back with us. We're going to be um, discussing zinc and copper mining in relation to the global flood. Thursday, Ken Hoven versus Jordan from Reasons to Doubt on the Age of the Earth. I am pumped for that one. So guys, definitely don't miss um, this week. We've got a lot of fun streams. And if there's any questions that have been raised or anything that I may not have addressed from tonight, please let me know, guys. Um, and that being said, God bless. Glad to see it's a good chat even at 3 a.m. Um, yeah, hope you guys enjoyed. And SFT is out.